My name is Brett Marcus. I'm the VP of uh, Strategy and Innovation at SciFutures. We're a foresight and innovation consultancy. Um, and we work across a wide variety of uh, markets, we work across a wide variety of problems, um, and we help our clients solve um, problems that may affect their growth and opportunities in the, in the future. Um, I want to talk about why uh, the future is now, um, even though that may sound a little bit trite, um, but also start to justify why we think that future is now, and I'll walk you through some of the changes that we think are going to develop. Um, we say that change today is exponential. Um, being a futurist, which is the last part of my title, um, is difficult because a day doesn't go by in which something happens in the market that all of a sudden I have to reevaluate the future. And so I just hope that on uh, any given day when let's say there's an Apple uh, developer conference that at least whatever they announce still conforms to my view of the future for that day. But because change is exponential, we have to have a very proactive and a very aggressive stance toward um, development and looking at opportunistic um, ways in which we can affect our own futures. Uh, at any given moment, you may see somebody pop up, whether it's a Nest or a Square or a Pandora or a Khan Academy, that's going to disrupt an existing market. Now, the problem is there's what we call the linear path to doom. And we like to say if you don't know if you're on the linear path to doom, well, you're probably on the linear path to doom. Uh, companies like Blockbuster and Kodak weren't thinking about the exponentiality in which we exist today, where the pace of change is so great, the scale of, changes, uh, the scale of the change is so great, that we have to think about the ways in which we may be disrupted. At, otherwise, we will be the disruptees. So there were very smart people at Blockbuster and very smart people at Kodak. It wasn't because they were not intelligent or they weren't good at their jobs. The problem is that we have a little bit of a cognitive disconnect when it comes to this notion of exponentiality. Uh, There's a great quote from Bill Gates who says that we always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. And this speaks to this very difficult job that we have when we're looking at the future to spot and forecast correctly so that we're really good at saying, we think this thing's going to be right here. We're really not so good at saying, what's that thing going to be way over the edge? And in fact, Bill Gates wrote this in his book about 15 years ago. We would say that that rate of change has actually decreased quite a bit. So it's not two years and 10 years. It's probably more about the scale of months. So just a little bit of context about Sci Futures and what we do. We help clients make the cognitive and creative leap so that they're able to um, overcome that cognitive barrier for that exponentiality. And we do that through stories and prototyping, experimentation, uh, analysis, so that we can bring preferred futures to life. So that we're taking an opportunity that the brand or our client may see, and we're charting the path for them to get there. The other part of what we do is that we want to make things very actionable for our clients. When I say the future of mobile is now, we are basing our sci-fi prototyping, which is actually something that we engage in, in science fact. So we don't want to be the kinds of futurists that go around and say, um, you know, there's going to be a, a hologram inside every bathroom and it's, you know, these, the, that's how it's going to affect your world because that's not going to happen, right? So we're grounding it in things that are actually going to come up and change in the, in the near future. We tend to work on a five to ten year horizon. When we're looking at mobile, um, one way of contextualizing it helps for us to look at it in a series of eras. So when you look at, you know, yesterday of where we were when mobile started, really not so long ago, we would say that it was really a communication uh, time when it was essentially a smaller phone. Um, you had paging, you had text, you had email, but it was really much a, a communication device. Then we moved into um, where we really are today, where we've got a device and an ecosystem that's content focused, that's communication focused, and there's some utility. Um, we're able to do things like use Uber. Um, we're able to do things like um, you know, take, take photos, and those, those may have a utilitarian aspect to it. Where we think we're about to go is that utility will all of a sudden jump to the top of the list. Now, I won't say that utility will overcome or displace those other aspects, 
that it's more of an ecosystem of utility and content communication. So we look at this as technology potentially creating the platform, and the question that we want to answer for our clients and for have the conversation today is, who will create and enable that utility? So once there is this backbone, how do you take advantage of that and start to find opportunities that will extend you into the future and avoid the, disruptive, uh, the disruption of another group? So these are some of the ways in which we think that utility um, will be enabled by changes in screen, by changes in form, um, by changes in sensors, and speed and intelligence. So I'll go through and talk about how some of these may change. If you look at the way the mobile device has evolved over um, the last 15 or 20 years, um, you can see, for example, the screen getting a lot larger. And if we look at this from the perspective of the linear path to doom, we would perhaps extrapolate that size. And we would say, oh, OK, well, we see where this is going. Content is being consumed. The screen is perfect for content. Let's assume there's going to be just a series of phones that keep going in this sort of pattern, but maybe they get a little bit larger in size as we go forward. That would be sort of an evolutionary model. And we'd say, all right, it's just going to get more refined. I think that we're actually looking at something more along the lines of chrysalis, where we've got an opportunity now where the technology will perhaps shift in a really interesting di direction, so that we're not just talking about this form factor that we all know and love and we all have in our hands right now. It'll be something a little bit different. I think the screens of, of our devices are, are kind of bad. You know, we have them because we ended up there as a function of this sort of iterative evolution that made sense. But, you know, when you hang your head down like this, oh, excuse me. Uh, that's about 60 pounds that you're putting down your spine. That's not good. That's the bad UI. That's bad user experience. The other thing is that the screen has two definitions. It's a panel on which images are displayed, but it's also a partition. So for example, you can imagine somebody who's walking around a pool that they would see every single day, be looking at their phone and fall in, as we saw in the video earlier. This is a weird concept for mobility. If you think about mobility, this is a way for you to move around uh, your environment easily. And yet, our mobile devices, the very, the very um, image of mobility, are preventing us from having that, that unfettered movement. So I forgive, forgive me. Um, show of hands, who's, who's tried Google Glass? OK. Um, you probably have the same opinion as I am that I, I don't like Google Glass. It got to the point in our office where we shared it around, and um, it literally got to a point where I had to put it on someone's desk and run away, so I wouldn't have to be in charge of it anymore. But the utility and the potential value of Google Glass is really interesting. So rather than focus on where a Google Glass maybe didn't really perform as well as we would have liked, let's look at it from uh, a metaphorical aspect and look at it as an opportunity to remove that occlusion of the screen and this bad user experience, and start to think about the ways in which screens may be more of a lens that's focusing the world in a way that brings value, as opposed to separating us from the world. There's a lot of different ways in which this can be done. Um, the most far-reaching and far-future way of doing this is something like an interactive contact lens. Um, there are ways of doing this. These are still very far in the future. Something more immediate is something like Microsoft's HoloLens, which you see here or Magic Leap, which you see over here. Now, Magic Leap's interesting um, because I'm sure a lot of you have at the very least heard of Magic Leap because Google made a tremendous investment in them. Um, but they've also been very secretive. Uh, now, the irony is that it's really not that big a secret. We know how they're going to do it. Uh, there's a head mounting device. I'm sorry, let me, let me back up. Uh, so what Magic Leap, for those of you who don't know, is going to do is they will create a very lifelike um, image for you to observe uh, that floats out there in space. And the way they're going to do that is by literally um, shining a projection onto the retina. We hope it doesn't damage retinas. 
And the outcome of what that achieves is something like what you see here. So here's the iconic image of what Magic Leap delivers, where in this case, you'll actually be able to look down your hands and see a tiny elephant. That's not necessarily utility. Utility is maybe something more like what HoloLens is going to provide, where that I'm providing a digital overlay on top of my physical world. And so that I'm able to augment um, my experience in a way that's really powerful and really profound. From a marketing standpoint, we can look right now at what happens in some scenarios with things like augmented reality, where you see an overlay on the world that helps provide some in additional information. Now, I don't necessarily think, uh, nor am I proposing that uh, sort of lower third banner display ads are going to be the best way for brands to integrate themselves in that future. But this is a model of what you might see through these sorts of lens displays in the future. Now, visual is not the only way in which we can get feedback from a device. Um, there is also audio. So if anybody saw the movie Her, a lot of the control um, that was being dictated by his device was coming through his earpiece. There's also haptics. So the ability for a machine to replicate some sort of movement, for me to feel that, and for me to respond to that. So the, the important notion here is that um, the way in which we engage with our devices and the way in which we see them has potential to change pretty dramatically in the next five years. And that brings me to form. So as long as I'm taking away the screen, let's take away some other things as well. Um, you may have heard about Google's Project Aura. So this is a project that's been around for a few years, and it's kind of been the geek dream for a while of what if I had a phone, and I could take the components I wanted, and then slot them in, and then it would be my phone, and then I could do cool stuff, and I could have different sensors. And that's kind of what they're developing here. And the idea is that there's a platform. I take the various sensors. I slot them in, and that I end up with this kind of metaphor so that my, I've got my base. I've got these little magnetic uh, modules that clip in, and then I develop my phone. And from there, I've now got my phone that I can carry around and take around my world. I actually think it's the other way around. And so that what Aura is doing is providing the basis for phones to get blown apart. So the real value is the, in this is that while today we've got a system where the phone speaks to the wearable, that we have a potential for wearables to actually be the device, to be the CPU, to be the control center through which all the other rest of the world communicates with us, with our mobile ecosystem. So that you might see our device, our mobile device, communicating with our interface, or your dog, um, your hipster dog, to be clear. Um, <laughs> so that you're getting data from your dog. And I have to assume that hipster dog data would be any, better than any other kind of dog data. Um, the other thing that, that Google announced at uh, Google I.O. just a couple weeks ago was Project Jacquard, where they're actually building sensitivity into fabric. So now that your genes potentially become part of the Internet of Things. Another part of the Internet of Things is something like uh, a sensor. This is a nose. So this is developed with the Department of Defense. Um, but it's actually got other uses. So for ex example, it can smell rotting food. I'm sure there's a brand out there that can make value out of that. It's not just the Internet of Things, there's also something we call the Identity of Things, which is the ability for machines to identify objects and content without having necessarily a digital aspect to it. So in this example, another, forgive me, another Google example, I'm not paid by Google, there's two good examples. Um, the device is actually identifying potentially the caloric content of your food simply by taking a picture and then being able to identify what's in the picture and then correlate that back to a database of calories. So this is now my ability to have a small device which my mobility becomes a cloud of mobility. It's not just tethered to my device. Now, if that happens, I have to still control my device. And how might that work? Uh, here are a few examples. So um, God, in retrospect, I have so many Google things. Here's another Google thing. Um, but this is really cool. So it's basically a radar on a chip. It's called Project Solely. And it allows you to control a device using radar, essentially. Tiny chip, but rather than having to touch or you know, actually apply a, a touch sensitivity, I can move my hand. It can, do, you know, can capture all that movement. Um, this is a form of biometrics, where it's actually reading goosebumps in order to determine my emotional state. And then here is a woman um, who has been working with DARPA uh, for, for several years. Um, here she is about five years ago feeding herself a chocolate bar. She's a quadriplegic. 
So there's actually a mind machine interface. It taps in, and she's able to manipulate this arm and feed herself. And what's really cool is that about, um, I think about a month ago, they revealed that she's actually been flying an F-35 with her mind, so that the fidelity of her control has gotten so exact that she's able to fly a plane. Uh, simulator, just to be clear, it's a simulator. Um, real quickly, let's talk about speed. So content is obviously very important for us right now. Um, YouTube has about one megabit per second as a recommendation for their HD content. Netflix has five megabits per second for HD quality and 25 for ultra HD. Um, our average US mobile speed is about 10.1. Um, very good for the rest of the world. Despite that quality and our ability to get high def content, we're looking at a future in which um, two gigabit per second mobile connection, uh, 20,000 faster, 20,000 percent faster than what we have now is coming potentially in the next five years. Uh, as they say, today it takes up the space of a minivan. It's going to fit in a smartphone um, by 2020. In lab conditions, there's even been 10 million times faster than what we have today. That's one terabit per second. Why do you need that? Well, today, if you're watching Jurassic Park on your device, that's linear content and tie def, that's all well and good. But let's think about the future. Well, all of a sudden, we have virtual reality. Maybe it's a nonlinear stream. So there's all of a sudden all this more additional data that we have to try to deal with, where video, VR, gaming, apps, web content, 3D printing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Internet of Things, all of this data all of a sudden becomes very important for us to be able to take in. And uh, the last one I want to talk about is intelligence. So there's been this great debate recently about the threat, the ex existential threat to the human race of AI. So we have our traditional sort of evil face of AI uh, here on the left. And then here's the cute face of, of AI today. So this is an example of a toy that's powered by IBM's Watson. And it allows a child who's playing with it to ask questions. And the uh, control powered by Watson will actually increase the complexity of the questions as they go forward. We already have this today in some format. It's a narrow AI through something like Google Now. And of course, yesterday, um, Apple uh, also announced their own sort of uh, they have a good word for it, but sort of a, a more fully enabled Siri. So we have screen with unobstructed mixed reality. We have form with widely distributed device. We have sensors, a responsive physical world. We have speed, which is incredibly rich data incredibly quickly. And we have intelligence with exceptional relevance. This all amounts to a world seamlessly curated and refined by a smart ecosystem that always knows who you are, where you are, and what you want. I'm not saying this is now, today. But in order for us to prepare for this future, we have to start thinking about this today and preparing the competencies that allow us to get there. So in this scenario, technology creates the utilitarian foundation, and the brand becomes the algorithm. So we don't need to worry about creating the technology. We have to worry about how we fit into this technological ecosystem. So some real simple um, guiding principles to start out with. Um, how can we make lives better? If consumers are now going to expect utility from their ecosystem, how can we deliver that? How can we respect the relationship? Um, there's nothing worse than the guy you've met five times, and then on the sixth time, he says, nice to meet you. Consumers aren't going to have that kind of tolerance in the future. So how can we, expect, how can we um, align interactions so that we're improving the memory and, and providing relevance regardless of platform or environment? But don't be creepy about it. Um, Consumers are going to be uh, more free with their privacy, but we still have to respect that and make sure that we are um, being, have, we have a very light touch. Um, and then lastly, we have to start experimenting now. Um, as I said, because these things are available today, competency developed today will pay dividends as these things become prevalent in the very near future. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.